Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be reviewing and paging through Call of Cthulhu Melius Monstrarum from Chaosium Inc. Are these two volumes must haves for any Call of Cthulhu keeper out there? Or would you be better served if you just slipped away out the door before purchasing this slipcase set? Well, you're gonna find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang, and happy holidays. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, I am going to be reviewing Melius Monstrarum in just a moment. But first, I do want to remind you, if you like this video, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you subscribe, ding that bell, because not only will it let you know when I upload videos such as this, it'll also inform you when my live stream, The Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs Monday through Thursday nights right here on YouTube as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news. Of course, when you're not watching videos on The Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Without further ado, we are taking a deep dive into Call of Cthulhu, Milius Monstrorum, which is from Chaosium Inc. It's written by Mike Mason, Scott David Anilowski, and Paul Fricker. Artwork is provided by Luik Musi. I believe I'm pronouncing these names correctly. Hopefully, I'm at least close. The two-volume slipcase set is available right now. It has recently come out in print. It's available for $89.99. You can score the combined 480 pages in PDF from DriveThruRPG for $39.99. Do you want to mention, if you are considering going over to DriveThruRPG, the Gaming Gang is an affiliate of the One Bookshelf sites. So if you are going to go visit, please stop by thegaminggang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you do happen to make a purchase, I get a little portion of that sale. And all those little portions really do add up to help keep the gaming gang around. Let's swing on over to the other camera because here are both volumes of Milius Monstrarum. And before we dive into these, do you want to mention that the fine folks over at Chaosium Inc. were kind enough to present me with this review copy of the slipcase set. Do have to point out that neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share my thoughts about this release. It's important for you to know that. So we're gonna jump into the first volume. And the first volume here is Monsters of the Mythos. And this is, uh, really an essential bestiary here because not only are we going to discover various different mythos monsters and creatures, we also will get some folklore uh, creatures as well as beasts. So jumping on in, first thing is, look at that, a bookmark. Always love bookmarks. The European RPG books always have bookmarks. Always good to see some of our American publishers doing that as well. There is a lot of information packed into both of these volumes. So first off, we're going to get uh, a bit of information, and this is really facing the keeper, talking about presenting monsters, the sights, the sounds, the smells. How do you play monsters? How do you kind of get behind the scenes and and pull the strings as a puppet master so that these monsters come across not only as scary, but also in a realistic manner. Also some information about creating monsters as well. We get a comparative size chart. We have seen 
something similar to this in the investigator's handbook as well as the keeper's guide. We get some random uh, tables if you want to utilize those as well. Talking about how the entries are broken down. And then we're going to jump on into strange and unusual Monsters of the Cthulhu Mythos. I have to mention that I do wish the paper stock was just a tiny bit thicker. It's not bad. It's not cheap or chintzy or anything like that. But I do wish that it was just a hair thicker. I just get the impression that it would be very easy to accidentally tear these pages. But I'm just kind of zipping through this real quickly. I don't want to uh, to have like, you know, a 45 minute video for the two volumes here. But just want to kind of give you a good look at everything in here. One other item I should point out, almost every one of these entries does have artwork. Now that's something that's that's in volume one, not so much volume two, and we'll see that when I page through that as well. So we've got mainly information about the the creatures themselves. We get some alternate names, which I like a lot. This is something that was introduced a while back. So it's not, you're not always, a deep one's not always called a deep one. And it kind of helps throw off your players as well. One aspect I would have liked to have seen is maybe just a, a quick mention of where did these appear originally? Were they in a story? Are they from a Call of Cthulhu adventure? Is it is it actually a Lovecraft tale? Is it maybe an August Derleth tale? Or some maybe even, you know, Robert E. Howard. Robert E. Howard did some Cthulhu mythos stories as well. Actually, very good horror stories. Howard was actually a, a really good author when he wasn't just trying to crank things out so he could pay the bills. And some of his horror stories are actually really good. The Mego. Ah, these are some of my favorite Lovecraftian creatures. The Mego. Ah, it, from one of my all-time favorite Lovecraft stories as well. So we get a, a bit of information about, obviously, combat. But what are these creatures? What are they doing here? What What is their purpose? What is kind of their, um, their game plan, almost, in some ways? Just kind of zipping on through here. The Rat Thing from Tales in the Witch House. As I mentioned, not every entry does have artwork, but the vast majority of them do. The sugar. From my favorite Lovecraft story at the Mountains of Madness. It's more a novella than a, a story, actually. Like the artwork, I wish there was more color artwork. But that's it's fine. See, it, it's why with the, like the color artwork, all of a sudden, it almost seems like out of place when it pops up compared to the other. It's not necessarily black and white. It's almost like a um, almost like a grayscale with a, a hint of brown to it. So we have lots and lots of Lovecraftian creatures. Then we're going to move on into folklore creatures in just a second here. The children of Yig. Great race of Yith. And we get the cover artwork for, this is actually from the Deities book. And here we go. Now we've got our monsters from folklore. These uh, don't have a lot of images in them. Man-eating plant. 
But for the most part, I think we all kind of know what a skeleton's going to look like, what a zombie's going to look like. Then we get into beasts. And essentially, this book here covers anything you could possibly want to throw at the player characters, be it Lovecraftian mythos creatures to folklore creatures to just beasts of different different kinds, various different venomous spiders. And then we get a pronunciation of mythos names, which I am always mispronouncing things constantly. We get some sheets for the keeper to utilize as far as their monsters and minions, a bit of artwork, and then we're going to finish up with the index at the end. And that is the first volume. And here's the team behind it. So this this is essentially, this is the, the best Yuri. This really is the best Yuri here. Now, the second volume is also considered to be a bestiary, but it's the, the deities of the mythos, or as my friends across the pond like to say, mythos. So we're going to jump into here. We're going to get uh, a bit of an introduction talking about utilizing these various different deities, these great old ones, the outer gods. What are the human perceptions of them? We have to keep in mind that uh, the way Lovecraft wrote a lot of the mythos stories, the, the great old ones, they, they have plans that are beyond human comprehension. So we don't, we don't really know what, what the deal is. So we're going to jump into here, and there's some information about how to design your own deities. And it's going to talk about the deities by type, and then we're going to jump on in. Got to point out, the artwork is not overflowing in this book. I was a little disappointed by that as a thaw. But then when we do get artwork, it's, it's pretty nice. But I am a little surprised that we don't have as much artwork as we did, or at least it doesn't seem to me to have as much artwork as the first volume did. But there is just loads and loads of information about the various different great old ones and outer gods and other deities as well. I got to be honest, reading through a lot of this, I was like, what is that from? I've never heard of that. What is that from? Once again, one of the things that I would have liked to have seen was where have these appeared, or at least the first appearance, because I know a lot of this, uh, a lot of these deities have been utilized from Call of Cthulhu Adventures or source books. And uh, I would just have been curious, just like we saw, if I remember correctly, in the the grimoire of spells, I think it told us like what adventure the spell came from. I would have liked to have seen something like that in the deity book. Something that will throw a lot of people off is you see that we have hit points. So Cthulhu has hit points. Nayar Lothotep has hit points. I always thought that was very silly. Of course, if you are running Pulp Cthulhu, okay, I can understand that. I can I can see utilizing hit points because that's more, you know, yeah, two-fisted action and come on, come on, Arlo, that's that, put them up. Whereas if you're more like me and tend to run more traditional Call of Cthulhu adventures, although I do tend to throw in a little bit of um, kind of pulp action, almost like cliffhanger, old serials is kind of how I like to run my Call of Cthulhu campaigns. I would not be utilizing any hit points for the, these, these entities are just too alien and too powerful 
to really do any damage to it. And of course, in the book, it, it does point out where, you know, if you, if you destroy the physical manifestation, you're not really destroying Caster as an example. You're just destroying a physical manifestation. Some other information that we get about each of these, the king in yellow, is uh, information about their cults, who worships these different deities, what are they looking to accomplish, different encounters, where would you encounter uh, either the, the deity or some of their minions, their followers, their cultists. And uh, we also get information about their aura. What is their kind of their, their essential uh, aspects? So for an example, Lilith, we have aura is mystery, glamour, and sensuality are often key elements in the appearance of Lilith, each designed to ensnare the unwary and foolish. But yeah, I see uh, some of this stuff is like, uh, well, okay, so I've, I've heard of this Mordegigan. But like I said, there are quite a few of these where, like Mother of Pus, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar where, where that came from. But, I mean, this is, once again, this is jam-packed with info as well as we're zipping on through here. Unlike the first volume, we're, we essentially get, this is just all the different deities. So we do have, uh, we've got great old ones mixed in with the outer gods and various other deities as well. One thing that I had thought, and maybe I'm just misremembering this. There we go. There's Mayor Lothotep. At least that's how I've always pronounced Mayor Lothotep. I could have swore that when seventh edition came out, that the decision had been that it was only going to be official mythos stories that they would draw from. They weren't drawing from like August Derleth, Robert Block, Robert E. Howard, anything like that. Now that may have changed, but I could have swore I seem to recall that from the from the core books. See, look, look at all of this, boy. I tell you, here you go. Shabnigarath. The Lady of the Woods. I remember uh, when Chaosium used to, to publish the fiction, which they may still do. <laughs> I, uh, God, I apologize if they, if they still do, and I'm just not aware of it. I remember there was a collection that had a story about Shubnigarath, which just scared the bejesus out. It just creeped be out to no end. And of course, I read that I was probably in my 40s. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, I can't believe how creeped out I am by this story. All right, we're almost finished zipping on through here. But you would be hard pressed to try to find information about the mythos creatures or deities between these two books you'd be hard pressed to not find what you're looking for. You really, really would because there is just so much packed in both these volumes here. Yog Sothoth. As you'll, as you can see that some of the, the more major, I guess I'll say players in the mythos do have larger entries than than some that are just sort of, well, some that, like I said, I'm not even sure where they originate from. Once again, I really do wish that there was more artwork throughout this volume. You are getting tons of gameable material, though. So it is, it is certainly not a situation where well, which we don't see that much 
anymore. We used to see it a lot more in role-playing game releases where there was just so much artwork and your actual word counts were, were pretty small because uh, 50% of the book was just art. That's definitely not the case. Once again, we've got these minion and master sheets for the monsters and our index and the team behind both volumes once again. All right, so that is volume two, Deities of the Mythos or Mythos. And this is volume one. I'm gonna swing on over to the other camera. I'm gonna provide you with my final thoughts and give the slipcase set a review score. So if you are familiar with the gaming gang, if you follow me, if you if you visited the site over the last what, almost 11 years that we've been around or you've caught any of my videos, especially about Call of Cthulhu who releases, you know I am a huge fan of Call of Cthulhu. It is my favorite role-playing game of all time. I have run it for decades. And that said, with the storied history of Call of Cthulhu, and I have been around since the beginning when it came out in that one inch deep cardboard box, there have been a lot of best series. There have been a lot of monster books, mythos books with creatures in it that have come out for Call of Cthulhu across the various different editions. They all pale in comparison to this slipcase. This slipcase set is essentially the end all be all of mythos bestiaries or bestiaries, however you want to pronounce it. I think these are phenomenal. Now, Sammy already did a written review of the PDF release and she gave it a nine out of 10. And I'm right there with her. Now, the only small critiques I have is I would have liked to have seen a little thicker paper stock, just a little bit, just a, just a hair more. It does feel, it does feel a little thinner than many of the other kind of core releases that are coming out from other companies. But that said, the production quality of these is really, really well done. Would also have liked to have seen more artwork in the uh, Deities book here in volume two. It's a little light on the artwork. I would have liked to have seen more. And I would have liked to have seen more of it in color. Not a huge deal, not, not a massive problem. And the other item was that I would have liked to have seen where whatever the entry was, where the first appearance was from. It, be it, was it a short story? What is it, was it a Call of Cthulhu adventure? Was it a, a Call of Cthulhu story by another author? Something like that. I would have liked to have seen where the original uh, appearance of either the mythos creature or mythos deity actually was. Very minor critiques, I really have to say. On a scale of 1 to 10, I certainly give this, it's so close to a 10. It is, oh, so tempted to give this a 10 out of 10. It just falls a hair short. Just a hair short. So I give it a 9.5 out of 10. It is that good. Essentially, if you have an interest in Call of Cthulhu and running Call of Cthulhu, you can't do any worse than to pick up the two slipcase sets that you can snag. One has the Investigator Handbook, the Keeper's Guide, as well as your Keeper Screen, and the other is Malleus Monstorum, because with just those books and dice, You'll never need anything else. And you can have a lifetime of Lovecraftian role-playing adventure right there in front of you. So it is this slipcase set is that good. I give it my highest recommendation with just a few little quibbles. All right, that is it for this time out. Once again, if you like this video, by all means, give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you do subscribe, ding that bell. 
because not only will it let you know when I upload videos such as this review, it'll also let you know when my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs right here on YouTube Monday through Thursday nights as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. That's it for this time out. And once again, happy holidays to everyone out there. You might be watching this after the holidays, but hopefully you had happy holidays or at least as happy as they can possibly be during this never-ending pandemic. With that said, also, as I tend to wrap up all my videos during the aforementioned <laughs> never-ending pandemic, I do hope all of you out there are being smart and staying safe. Oh, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, if you'd like to subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel, by all means, click right here. And if you'd like to check out one of our recent live streams, click right up top. And if you want to roll the dice and see what the algorithm for YouTube recommends, click right here. And of course, thank you once again for watching. And gang, please stay safe and wear a mask.